Hello everybody, I hope you're all doing well. In this video, I'm going to explain the basics of camera settings. This video is the first of a series, with this video being focused on the exposure of an image, how it is determined, the exposure triangle, and how you can use different settings to set the exposure of an image. And with that, the different effects that goes along with these settings. At the end, I'm going to discuss how this information can be used in the real life with a few scenarios. The exposure triangle is an illustration that shows the relationship between three things that determines the exposure of an image. The three things are aperture, shutter speed and ISO. The exposure of an image is the brightness of it how dark or light the image is. Aperture, the first part of the exposure triangle. The aperture is a physical hole in the lens that lets light through to the sensor of the camera. The aperture determines two things, but influences more than that. Number one, the amount of light that the lens lets through to the sensor. And number two, the depth of field. So first, the amount of light that passes through the lens. The size of the hole can be mechanically changed to let different amount of light through, with a smaller hole letting less light through than a bigger hole. The size of the hole is described by the f-stop. The f-stop is a number ranging from high numbers that represent smaller holes like f22 or f11 and smaller numbers representing bigger holes like f2.8 or f1.2. That is how a hole in the lens controls the amounts of light going through the lens. And with varying light intensities follows changes in exposure. The second thing is depth of field, described by most photographers as the thickness of a plane at which objects are acceptably in focus, or a range of distances from the camera at which objects are acceptably sharp. This is not to be confused with the distance of the subject from the camera, although this also influences the depth of field. A shallower depth of field means a smaller range or a thinner plane at which objects are acceptably in focus. And a larger depth of field means a larger range or a thicker plane at which objects are acceptably sharp. The word acceptably is used because no matter what the f-stop, there's actually only one line at which subjects are truly in focus, with the foreground and the background fading to blur from that line. The rate at which subjects fade to blur from that line is determined by the f-stop. Because larger apertures creates a faster fade to blur from that line, there's a smaller plane or a thinner plane at which subjects are acceptably sharp. Because I don't want this video to get too long, I will link a video up here explaining depth of field in far more detail than I just did. But basically, larger aperture settings like f1.4 creates a very blurry background at the back of and in front of the subject. And with smaller apertures like f22, the foreground and background would barely be blurry and could almost be identified as in focus too. Aperture is a very powerful tool to create the effect you want. A great way to isolate a subject is by using shallow depth of field created by larger apertures like f1.4. While talking about depth of field, there are other things that can change the depth of field. For instance, focal length which is the zoom of your lens. Lenses with longer focal lengths are zoomed in a lot and has a small depth of field, like binoculars, while lenses with a shorter focal length are wider and can see more, like a smartphone camera. Lenses with longer focal length create shallow depth of field than wider lenses with the same aperture setting. The distance of the subject from the camera also influences depth of field, with subjects being closer to the camera, if focused on, create shallower depth of fields. Then, part two of the exposure triangle is shutter speed. To understand shutter speed, 
you have to know what a shutter is. And to know that, I have to explain the parts of a camera body. At the back of the camera, there is the sensor. This is the part of the camera that is sensitive to light. And this part also changes the light signals into electrical signals. It's basically the modern version of film. It captures the image and this is also the part with all the pixels. In front of that there is the shutter. It's a flat part that covers the sensor. This is the part that allows the sensor to be exposed when opened. This is also the part that determines the second part of the exposure triangle which is shutter speed. Shutter speed determines one thing and that is the duration at which the shutter is open or not covering the sensor. This is the time that light has to pass through the camera to the sensor. Shutter speeds in most cameras can go up to one four thousandth of a second and in some cameras up to one eight thousandth of a second and as slow as 30 seconds in most cameras and a lot longer with a device that plugs into your camera called a remote. If you like this video, please push the like button below. And if you like wildlife photography or just photography in general, and you like my videos, please consider subscribing and ring the bell so that you can get notified when I post more videos. And if you have friends that might benefit from my videos, please consider sharing them. Shutter speeds influences motion blur. With longer exposures, Light is projected onto the sensor for longer durations of time. And if the subject or anything within the frame moves, it creates a blur from the beginning to the end. Faster shutter speeds can limit or fully eliminate motion blur in an image. But it has a downside. It lets less light through the sensor and therefore less brightening in this part of the exposure triangle. I will show you an example with an image taken with a fast shutter speed and also an image taken with a slower shutter speed, with one showing motion blur and the other not. Longer shutter speeds creates longer exposures and therefore more brightening in the shutter speed part of the exposure triangle. I say that it adds more brightness or less brightness in the specific part of the exposure triangle because in most cases varying shutter speeds, varying apertures and varying ISOs is compensated in different parts of the exposure triangle to keep the brightness of the image the same. Then the third part of the exposure triangle is ISO. The ISO setting of the camera is the amount of amplification added to the electrical signals coming from the sensor of the camera. In simpler terms, it's the sensitivity of the sensor to light. ISO stands for the International Organization of Standardization. ISO values typically range from 100, which is the base ISO for most cameras, up to 6400 in cheaper lower end cameras, and up to 3.3 million sometimes in higher end bodies. The base ISO of a camera is the lowest ISO setting available. With some cameras, the base ISO is even lower than 100. Shooting an image at the base ISO of the camera would deliver the best image quality. Higher ISO settings has a lot of negative effects on the image. Higher ISO settings causes grain to appear on the image. This is also called noise. This appear because no amplifier is perfect and no amplifier can amplify a signal without any imperfections. It also makes the image less sharp and also decreases the dynamic range. The dynamic range of a camera is the camera's ability to maintain detail in the absolute highlights and absolute shadows of an image. Some cameras have good ISO performance and some cameras doesn't have that good ISO performance. Cameras with good ISO performance delivers better image quality shooting at higher ISOs than cameras with bad ISO performance 
that delivers images with a lot of grain and that isn't sharp at all. When you mount a camera for a lot of low light shooting or shooting in conditions with poor lighting like indoors, a camera with good ISO performance would be the best choice. Generally, cameras with bigger sensors have better ISO performance. Smaller sensors generally doesn't have that great ISO performance. Also, generally, cameras with lower megapixel counts have better ISO performance than cameras with larger megapixel counts that has the same sensor size. This is because each individual pixel is larger in a lower megapixel count camera and can therefore usually collect more light than smaller pixels. The ISO settings should always be kept as low as possible in any camera for the best image quality. So, how these settings work together to create the desired image and how the different parts of the exposure triangle are linked. Say you want to photograph something quick moving. In this case, you want a fast shutter speed to prevent motion blur. This may lead to a need of light. So to prevent the ISO from going up, you should open up the lens to a wider aperture or a smaller F number. If your lens is opened up all the way or you want to keep your depth of field larger, the only other option is to increase your ISO to prevent the image from getting too dark. If you shoot slow moving or stationary subjects, a higher shutter speed isn't necessary and the shutter speed can be decreased rather than increasing the ISO. If a shallower depth of field is desired, the aperture can be opened up or the F number decreased. If a larger depth of field is needed, the aperture can be closed down to a higher F number. This would mostly be the case with landscape photography where you want most of the image to be in focus. If more light is needed, the shutter speed can be slowed down. And if the shutter speed can't be slowed down, like in the case of a handheld shot or with something moving in the frame, like trees waving in the wind, the only other option would be to increase the ISO. Key things to remember. Always keep the ISO setting as low as possible for the best image quality. Fast action requires faster shutter speeds. If you want a very blurry background, the aperture can be opened up or the F number decreased. If more light is needed, slow down the shutter speed or open up the aperture rather than increasing the ISO. If you know you're going to shoot in darker situations, choose your lens with the widest aperture. If your images are blurry, increase the shutter speed and compensate with the aperture or ISO. That's all I have for today, so thank you for watching and bye bye.